Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Really glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We actually have all good martinis for you today. We're also brought to you by a brand new sponsor, the HR Experts at Bambi.com. Uh, But, Jim, we do need to start with some sobering news. We just spent all of yesterday, of course, talking about the legacy and the life of Rush Limbaugh, who passed away after a long, year-long battle with stage 4 lung cancer. And now we're finding out, again, just before coming on to record today, that uh, former Senate Majority Leader, 1996 Republican presidential nominee, 1976 vice presidential nominee, Bob Dole, uh, 97 years old, also diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. A very brief statement uh, says his treatment will begin on Monday, and he says he knows that other Americans are facing significant health challenges as well. So, um, Jim, we obviously wish Bob and and Elizabeth Dole the very, very best here, but it's extraordinarily difficult news, and it's uh, another very difficult day for the right. Yeah, uh, it kind of feels like, you know, when when it rains, it pours. It comes in bunches. And uh, look, I think we can't, you know, no one would dispute that Bob Dole has had a exceptionally full life, but, uh, you know, our thoughts are with him and his loved ones at this time. Well, let's talk about our good news here. We've got uh, plenty of it today. And let's start with the news uh, out of the nursing homes. We're going to have two related to nursing homes today. Let's start with what CVS is saying. You reported on this yesterday, Jim. Uh, CVS says that as of 4 p.m. Tuesday, the company has administered 100% of the first doses and 97% of the second doses in 7,822 skilled nursing facilities and 90% of the first doses and 47% of the second doses in 37,958 assisted living and other long-term care facilities. So obviously the, the biggest priority with these vaccines is the people at the greatest vulnerability for uh, COVID-19, and that uh, would seem to be the elderly based on all the data that we have. And while the rollout and the implementation of the vaccine distribution has not been as smooth as we would like in many cases, it appears that for many of the the people who are in the most at-risk category, the news is pretty good. Yeah. And if you are among those who'd like to get a vaccine and you may or may not be in the groups that qualify and you go online and you're told there are no appointments and you're told you didn't log on early enough in the day and you get up at 6 a.m. and you try it and it's the same sort of thing. Hearing news like this makes these frustratingly long waits a little bit easier to take. And it does point to most states doing what they're supposed to do. I think there's all a general agreement that we would want the vaccine going to the people who are most vulnerable first. And by and large, that is what happened. If you're a, uh, someone who's a senior or immunocompromised, but you're living alone or you're living with your family and you're not in an assisted living facility, and you're not able to get the vaccine, it's a little frustrating. Yeah, I wish you could get the vaccine now, but probably if you're living in a assisted living in an assisted living facility, a nursing home, a long-term care facility, something like that, you are unable to, to stay, it's, it's much tougher to stay six feet away from people. You're just going to encounter a lot more people. Uh, you're being counting, encountering caregivers. And, you know, as we've seen, uh, as what happened in New York and a variety of other states with the order from Andrew Cuomo, this is foreshadowing our second martini, that this, uh, this is where it can spread really, really quickly. And there was this eye-opening and unnerving figure from the COVID tracking project that said that uh, you know, less than 1% of Americans live in these kinds of long-term care facilities. Right now, at least as of like maybe you know, February 11th, I guess it was. So you know, one, week into, one week or so into February last week, they made up 36% of the U.S. COVID deaths, more than 166,000 deaths. Um, this is where we needed to start. This is where we needed to protect people the most. And by and large, we're not completely done. But it looks like everybody's gotten their first shot, which, as we know, gives them or automatically starts boosting your immune system, starts giving your uh, your your body starts adjusting to to that sort of virus. And they are well along on the second shot, particularly amongst uh, the medical facilities that involve higher levels of medical care. Also, so come something kind of interesting as I went through this, the, in case you're wondering, the uh, New York does not quite lead, it leads the, the country in terms of the number of deaths in long-term care facilities. That's 140, more than 14,000, uh, you know, about 1,600 higher than the next highest state, which was California. If you want to argue, okay, but how much is the proportion, the state that has the highest proportion of deaths that are occurred in these long-term facilities kind of surprised me. It's New Hampshire, 
but actually it's fairly small in terms of its total numbers. It's 790 out of 1,117 total deaths in the Granite State since this pandemic began. A uh, state with the lowest percentage is Alaska. It is a grand total of seven out of 280 total deaths in the state from COVID-19 occurring in those facilities. Look, there's not a lot of good news in this front. I'm very frustrated with the state of the rollout, but this is one thing that has worked out well. And so I have to say to CVS, to Walgreens, and to everybody in Operation Warp Speed who is involved in getting these vaccines there, good job, guys. You are almost done. Let's not, let, let's not let our uh, foot off the gas pedal. And we'll have a lot more to say about nursing homes in New York, which uh, did not start off well at all, as we have documented thoroughly here in the Three Martini Lunch. But uh, there's also the economic side of the pandemic, and running a business is always challenging. And over the past year, it's added so many different layers of of challenge. It's just amazing uh, that so many folks have been able to figure out a way to keep the doors open. But on top of all the COVID restrictions and other challenges that business owners face, HR issues can really be a problem as well. Uh, You can face wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, and HR manager salaries aren't cheap. They can average around $70,000 a year. But Bambi, spelled B-A-M-B-E-E, was created specifically for small businesses. You can get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, and maintain your compliance all for just $99 per month. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. From onboarding to terminations, they customize your policies to fit your business and help you manage your employees day-to-day, all for just $99 a month. Month-to-month, no hidden fees, cancel anytime. You didn't start your business because you wanted to spend time on HR compliance. Let Bambi help and get your free HR audit today. And as we've already discussed on the Three Martini Lunch this week, math can be hard sometimes, but $99 a month, considerably less than $70,000. So go to Bambi.com slash Martini right now to schedule your free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash Martini, spelled BAM to the B-E-E dot com slash Martini. All right, Jim, I think everybody knows where we're headed in our second martini here. Uh, What could possibly be good news about Andrew Cuomo and nursing homes in New York? Well, the feds are on the case now. You know, the exact thing they were trying to avoid by covering up their nursing home death statistics. Albany Times Union, the FBI, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn have launched an investigation that is examining, at least in part, the actions of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo's Coronavirus Task Force in its handling of nursing homes and other long-term care facilities during the pandemic the Times Union has learned. The probe by the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York is apparently in its early stages and is focusing on the work of some of the senior members of the governor's task force, according to a person with direct knowledge of the matter who is not authorized to comment publicly. And Andrew Cuomo, Jim is also, at least according to Assemblyman Ron Kim, the winner of this week's T.J. Ducklow Award for promising to destroy someone uh, because Kim would not go along with... um, Governor Cuomo's uh, plan to continue uh, to carry the water and uh, cover up what the administration had done there to deflect from the feds and to obviously keep really damaging information coming out during a political season. So what do you make of the feds getting involved here? Well, first, Greg, between T.J. Ducklow and Cuomo, why is it when you achieve a certain level of, of power and influence in Democratic Party politics, you start to sound like Dr. Doom? (laughs) <laughs> I will destroy you, Reed Richards. You know, um, just to, you know, this, like the moment you're threatening to destroy somebody, that's a sign you're on a power trip. You don't, you know, you know who I never hear threatening to destroy someone, Greg? Who? The little sisters of the poor, you know? <laughs> it, there's a great comedy sketch by this British duo where they, they play two Nazis who realize that they have skulls on their hats as part of their uniform. And they ask themselves, are we the baddies? And they realize, wait, if we have skulls on our hats, are we really the good guys? Doesn't, isn't that the sort of thing villains do? If you're running around threatening to destroy people, maybe SEAL Team 6 can do that. Maybe there are a couple of good guys. who run, But by and large, even they don't feel a need to chest, you know, thump their chests and talk about, you know, how, if, you, if you really are powerful and a, a force to be reckoned with and you need to tell people, you're not really that powerful or a force to be reckoned with. Um, but more specifically on Cuomo, like I was very pleased when the state attorney general, Letitia James, did that review of the nursing homes, concluded that the death numbers did not add up 
calculated that it had to be at least 50% higher. And lo and behold, the state came out, uh, I think it was either a day, either later that day or a day later and said, oh yeah, we actually missed these, you know, several thousand uh, by a significant amount. What I didn't see or hear was any word from Letitia James about whether there'd be any type of legal consequences for the state hiding this information and effectively covering up the extent of just how bad the circumstances were in the nursing homes and long-term care facilities of New York State, in large part because of the Cuomo and State Department of Health order saying to these facilities, you have to readmit recovering coronavirus patients even if they are still contagious. Um, I'm glad that there is uh, federal prosecutors now looking into this. The fact that they are on a Skype call saying we're afraid of being investigated by the federal government is a large glaring red neon sign that maybe something there is worth investigating. We will have to wait and see. I have a very hard time believing that they're going to be able to look at this and say, no, no, everything was on the up and up or, oh, this was all just a series of innocent mistakes and misunderstandings. Hopefully Cuomo himself doesn't get... uh, whitewashed and they don't throw some low levels low level employees in cincinnati i believe is the uh uh is the the common refrain in these sorts of circumstances but um look the fact that they're investigating cuomo is probably overdue and a necessary step for accountability in new york state government yeah watch out for the bus in albany uh if you work for andrew cuomo because he's not going to take the rap if he can avoid it uh but uh between what we're seeing from Letitia James and what we're seeing from the prosecutors in the Eastern District, uh, there may be more repercussions than just losing emergency powers. We will see. Hey guys, it's Mock and Daisy from the Chicks on the Right, and we're excited to tell you about our podcast, the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast. If you've been stressed lately with the information overload on social media or just don't feel like anything in the news makes sense anymore, don't worry, because we're here to clear things up. Every week we discuss topics like cancel culture, national crisis, what's happening to our new generations, and if you're just plain tired of people trying to tell you what to do or how to live your life, we tackle that too. Find out more by going to our website, chicksontheright.com, or start listening on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Don't forget to leave a comment or review and subscribe. All right, Jim, last piece of good news. And this I have to file under, I'll believe it when I see it, because we've heard so much from the Biden administration that seems to be deferring to the unions and figuring out reasons not to get back to school, uh, that Biden's promise to have kids back in school, at least K through eight, five days a week by the end of his first 100 days, Well, that would be great if we actually saw that, but but we don't know. I mean, he's talking about new HVAC systems, new ventilation for all these schools. Uh, The unions uh, claim they have to have whatever's in the the stimulus bill here. Uh, But Biden says that he believes that he can get this done, that these schools can be open K through eight, five days a week. I'm not sure whether that means all students in school all day, five days a week, or whether they've got to still kind of stagger it and hybrid it. Uh, But uh, it would still be a step in the right direction. But for an administration that seems to be looking for excuses uh, most days to not open up, uh, the fact that he still has this goal is a good thing. But uh, I'm still a little leery on whether he's actually going to be able to achieve this. Yeah. And look, this is a, I'm going to call a potentially good martini. It is not a certainty good martini. I do think it's an indicator. I thought it was interesting during that CNN town hall that first Biden had to insist that his policy was not that a school that is open one day a week qualifies as open. He said that was a failure in communication. Uh, Look out for that bus, Jen Psaki. Oh, 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 yeah. Because that was what Jen Psaki was defining an open school just a couple of days earlier. Okay, fine. Let's assume there's some miscommunication or Biden sees his White House press secretary going out and stating something that is not what he wants, doesn't meet his standards, and is not his policy. By the way, I keep in mind, there's more than once where we've had a situation, we saw this during the Trump years too. What Joe Biden thinks and what the Biden administration is saying, doing, and do, like they can sometimes be only distant cousins, right? They, they, they may have met each other, they may have shook hands, but they're not the same thing. And you just kind of wish that the, Joe Biden knew what the Biden administration was doing. He'd, he'd be really outraged if he knew it. Um, look, one, one of two things will happen. By the way, Biden's 100 days ends, I believe, April 29th. So we're looking at the end of April, early May. If all schools, and they, after a day, they kind of walked it back to K through eight, but I'll take it. Uh, if K through eight schools are across the country are open five days a week at the end of April, or early May, I will say, good for you, President Joe Biden. It wasn't really his decision. It was mostly, mostly up to state 
boards of education, local boards of education. But you know what? It is good to have a president and a Democratic president who is willing to say schools should be open by a certain date. That's not quite what he said, but it was close enough and I will take it. If it doesn't, there's really not much wiggle room on this. There's really not a case in which Biden said we should have schools open five days a week unless, you know, something bad happens or cases go up or in cases the teach in case the teachers unions don't want to. You know, like there there really wasn't any wiggle room to that. So one way or another, we're either going to be saying, hey, good job, Biden administration. Good job, Joe Biden on May 1st. Or we're going to be saying you failed. You went before the American public and you said you'd be able to deliver on this and you didn't. Lo and behold, governing is a lot tougher once you're in the Oval Office and once you're actually running the executive branch. We'll see how it hopes out. I hope he's I hope he's right. I hope that we know I think it's safe to say we have a whole bunch of jurisdictions, teachers have been either bumped to the very front of the line or pushed closer to the front of the line on the prioritization scale. I don't want teachers to go into classrooms where they feel unsafe. I do think though that in most of these cases, they're being asked masked to teach to students who are masked and they'll be staying six feet or more apart um we saw we talked earlier in the week about how the cdc director said that three feet distances should be fine um and they're doing so in many cases not uh five days a week this is not asking people to give cpr to ebola patients this is a virus that you have a 90 some percent chance of surviving Now, if you are particularly old as a teacher, if you're particularly immunocompromised or you live with someone who's immunocompromised, okay, I I understand. These are legitimate concerns. And I think the school board and everybody else kind of, let's figure out how we can work around this. Maybe it makes sense for particularly vulnerable teachers to maintain online learning past this point into the future. But as we've seen, lots of private schools have figured out how to make this work and a bunch of states have figured out how to make this work. Now, there's a whole question of like, we've been confronted with a really big problem. And it's like all hands on deck to figure out a solution. And in far too many of these cases, the attitude of, of, you know, not even I'm going to say the teachers, because there are plenty of teachers who are like, hey, look, I didn't sign up for this to talk to a screen. I talked to this because I love kids and I love teaching. This is my calling, right? They get into this because they want to do it. There are a whole bunch of teachers who want to get into the classroom as long as they, you know, feel safe and they feel like they're not, you know, exposing themselves to great risk by catching this virus. You know, there's no excuses anymore. You can, you can blame, there's no blaming schools for being at this state in March, 2020. There is blame for schools for being in this state of March, 2021. Guys, you've had a year to figure this out. It's time to get the kids back in schools in some form and ratchet it up as more and more teachers get vaccinated. But so, hey, you know what, Greg, we're having a, we're having a, we're having a snow day and thus online schooling is canceled here in Authenticity Wood. <laughs> As it is here, yeah. Let it slip, going from screen to screen. But, you know, it's a Biden martini, so uh, in addition to the fact that he might not be able to make good on it, there's another gut punch here. He also said in this town hall in Milwaukee on uh, Tuesday, we'll try to meet this 100-day goal. He says, you'll have a significant percentage of them being able to open. My guess is they're going to probably be pushing to open all summer to continue like it's a different semester. Parents, careful with the forehead on the desk. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, just telling you what might be coming down the pike. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I need to go into concussion protocol now, Greg. <laughs> Jim, uh, that's one of the less good, good martinis in a while. But uh, well, at least we had three today. So hopefully the, the others will compensate. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget about our friends over at Bambi. If you need help with human resources, it's your business, Bambi.com slash martini. Also, please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. We are very grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Remember to get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Thursday. And please join us Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.